Well, hello everyone. This is John Byrne with Poets and Quants. Welcome to our one-on-one -on -one series. We are doing a special interview here with Patty Russo, who is the program director of the online MBA program at Michigan Ross. And she is there in that magic studio. They call it the smart stage. Patty, welcome. Hello, John. How you doing? Uh, very good. Thank you. Good. So, so I just need to point out that Michigan Ross has the highest ranked full-time MBA program that also offers an online option. And in this case, you entered your first cohort, I believe of 72 students. That is correct. August of 2019. Mm -hmm. So you've yet to yet actually graduate anyone. I think the first graduates will come out in December of this year. And of course it's flexible and you can alter the pace of the program if you're in it. Um, and I remember that the initial goal was for 60 students and you got 72, but more important than any number, frankly, was the quality of the people that you enrolled in that first class. Uh, I know that the largest single contingent came from California. There are big contingents of students from uh, New York, Massachusetts, and Illinois. And uh, they came from some really big name companies, JP Morgan, uh, Chase, uh, BCG, Google, Google mm -hmm. Comcast, uh, Disney, uh, KPMG, uh, Unilever, mm -hmm. Yelp. Um, so how did it go? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, it's gone quite well. So um, you are right. You, you, uh, you have a great memory. We, did, um, we uh, um, ad admitted 72 students in that first year. Uh, we were, you know, we were, we were a little worried because, you know, you're building that bridge as you walk on it. Um, but what I would say is kind of quality in, quality out, right? Um, so the students that we admitted, we are maintaining really high standards of quality in terms of the students that we're, we're admitting. Um, and, you know, we have the same admissions uh, um, uh program as we have for all of our other MBA programs. So that has been great. So we have really admitted really great students and uh, they've been very involved in a way that I think I might not have at first thought, you know, so they are really excited to be a part of Ross and to be a part of the Ross community. We have an online MBA advisory council. That's great. Uh, and it's just been, you know, the, our faculty, our senior faculty have designed most of the courses. And I think it's just been a really good experience for everybody, for students and for me, for staff, for faculty. That's great. And your second cohort that was admitted in August of last year, what was mm -hmm. the size of that group? Um, so we had a little over a hundred. Now you'll you will remember that um, you know because of COVID, we actually suspended the uh, test requirement for last year. Because if you remember, like right at the time when students would have been applying, GMAT and GRE did not have a remote option yet. So we did suspend the the test re test requirement. So we admitted about, I'd say about 130, 140 students at that time. We also this past year initiated a winter intake um, where we, you know, winter intakes are always a little smaller, but we did get about 35 students in the winter. We did reinstate the test requirement at that time because then of course GMAT and GRE had their act together in terms of remote testing. And uh, we're still looking at the, the class for the fall intake right now. We're still admitting still, uh, you know, still, but we're, we're looking at a pretty good yield rate actually so far. That's great. And the, the winter intake begins in January? It does, yes. Yeah, that's great. It does. So let's, let's get into some of the basics. You know, what distinguishes the program from other programs above and beyond the great brand that Michigan Ross brings to the game? Yeah, I mean, I, so a couple of things I think that I um, mentioned already, right? This commitment to quality. So definitely a quality student body. 
Um, great students from all of those places that you mentioned. Um, we have the same admission standards. So, you know, you have to have an interview. We have three readers who go through the applications. So I think that is one thing definitely is that your colleagues, the people that you sit next to, even if it's virtually, are going to be kind of quality people, smart people who really want to be there. Our and senior faculty, I again. Of course, the importance of that. Because I think yes. a lot of people might not understand what that really means. You know, the dirty little secret of every great MBA program is most of the learning comes from your classmates. It comes from their experiences, from the places they've worked, from the things that they've done, and the things they're willing to share with you. And so getting the best people uh, side by side is a big deal. And that's mm -hmm. one of the things that a brand like Michigan Ross can do to make it totally differentiated from most of the other online options that are out there. Yeah, that is so true. And we've just, the quality of the students, every day they amaze me. Uh, I think the other two, the other thing too is every day they amaze me in the amount of energy that they have. You know, they work full time at very high level jobs. They have families, they have, they are taking what are very rigorous courses and yet still they have time for other things. They're really interested in doing other things here at Ross as well. Um, and then, you know, we, we are also, you know, I mean, you've heard about Ross and action-based learning. We've talked about that for, for many, many years. We see it as part of our brand. We feel the same way, right? We feel the same way even in, an, even in online courses. So, you know, our online courses all have synchronous sessions where faculty and students get together to, discuss cases and do activities. We have, again, as I said, the three residencies uh, where we have students come in and come to campus. We just had one a few weeks ago, our innovation residency, uh, which was uh, an entrepreneurial themed residency. So again, we do MAP. In fact, the students are going uh, through MAP right now. Ah, and I should say that MAP is the multidisciplinary uh, action project. Thank and you where you are basically paired uh, with classmates on a company or organization assignment. And you go in there and you basically uh, tackle a challenge that that company or organization is undergoing at a given time. How, how does MAP in the online MBA differ from the full-time MBA where you literally um, break the academic calendar to do it? Yeah, so, uh, it, and actually in our part-time MBA, MAP has always involved um, a longer time period than the full-time MBA. So um, it is a 14-week course rather than a seven-week course um, in, in the full-time MBA because we know that students, if they're working full-time, will need sort of a longer period of time to really make sure that they do right by this project. Uh, as far as kind of the fact that teams aren't together, that has always been uh, something that we've done in part-time MBA MAP. And uh, the teams work quite well sort of finding, you know, kind of creating their own weekly meetings. They're very, you know, it is in fact, right, it is an active consulting project where you are in many ways in charge of your destiny for good or for ill. So, um, you know, it is, it is up to the team to drive the project. It is up to the team to meet with the sponsor, to meet with their faculty advisor. So it's worked quite well. Uh, the the uh, MAP projects we have, I can't remember all of them right now, but let's see, we have a, a project, a current OMBA project with uh, Uber. We have one with Coinbase, uh, Anthem, Healthcare. Uh, so we've got some really nice projects as well. That's terrific. And I, I should point out, you know, a lot of, lot of programs have experiential learning, but this is a hallmark at Michigan Ross. And um, so, the, so the projects tend to be deeper, the more involved, <laughs> the more engaged in them. Um, a lot more effort is put into them. They tend to be yes. more ambitious, a lot longer, uh, and a bigger deal than a simple thing um, that is often offered elsewhere. The other thing I, I should point out that you haven't pointed out yet, but that you're dividing your um, incoming classes. I know the first class is divided in two. And why I mention this, I think, and I think this is an important aspect is, you know, there are a lot of online MBA programs out there that do not 
limit the size of the classes. Mm -hmm. And it's important, I think, because if you want active participation among the classmates and you want to give everyone a good chance at airtime, you really need to break down these classes. They can't be of an indefinite size that goes on and on forever. The other aspect of that is, is your smart stage there. You know, I know that your professors, when they're on that stage, have a view of every single student in they the do. class. Yes. And if you have hundreds of students in your class, you can't possibly read the body language, see that they want to speak and when they want to speak and, and make the conversation, the dialogue as dynamic as it can be. So actually limiting class size is a big deal for an online MBA program. And it's many of these uh, programs, that is not true. Yes, actually. Uh, so our class sections are divided into 50 students per section. So, um, and even our residencies, we only allow 60 students per residency to be able to, you know, make sure that that student experience is right. Um, you know, our professor of accounting, Greg Miller, who teaches the first accounting class, he likes to sort of see everybody, make sure that they're paying attention. If he thinks they're not paying attention, he likes to call on them. So um, yes, it is a good thing uh, to kind of keep, keep the sections smaller. Another, I think, point of differentiation is uh, the career support that you're giving uh, okay. these students. Obviously, this is a part-time program, so everyone is employed. But people may be looking for an MBA not only to enhance or accelerate their current position and their responsibilities where they currently work, but some may be looking toward the future and wanting to make some kind of change. And a school like Michigan Ross uh, is gonna offer a lot more career support, I imagine, than many of the other online MBA programs that, that kind of uh, stint on that. I mean, maybe you'll get a few videos on how to do a LinkedIn profile or do an interview, but you're not gonna have full access to the career development office, is that right? Yeah, I mean, that is such a good point because it, it is really sort of my experience now that even students coming into the full-time program um, are really looking for something new. Uh, so to your point, many students just, they, they hope to kind of progress in their company, but many students, I think given the investment of time and resources on a student's part to do an MBA nowadays, you know, many students are looking to change industries, they're looking to change roles, we have a lot of students who are have sort of a functional role and want to move up to become leaders, you know, to lead teams. And our students here have full access to the career development office. So they have the same access that a full-time student has. I have a few students right now um, who are on internships this summer. I have many students who will be joining the formal recruiting process this coming fall. Wow. That's fantastic. Yeah. Now, uh, this August will be the two year anniversary of the first uh, cohort that came in. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me what surprised you about the program and the early students that you've been able to attract. Well, I think uh, sort of the, the biggest thing I think is that we have really kind of been in, you know, we're still in a growth phase, right? Mm -hmm. So um, we, you know, we have a process by which we evaluate everything we do. Um, I always joke with the students that, you know, if you come to Ross, get used to taking surveys. So we have a process by which we evaluate everything we do. And, um, you know, one of the things I think we know is that students crave time with faculty. So whether that is um, a recording of a faculty member explaining a concept, or um, it is the time, you know, the face-to-face -face time in the, uh, in the live sessions. We, that I think is sort of one of the biggest things for us is that that's one of the, I think kind of like the biggest learnings is that students really crave faculty, time with faculty, and um, you know, how can we build even more of that in so that they feel like they're getting the best experience possible. And the faculty in the program are the same faculty who teach in the full-time and part-time MBA programs at Ross. That You're is correct. Yes. Lots of adjuncts who only teach in the online program or anything like that, right? 
no, that is correct. Yep, they teach across programs. And I think because this was such a new world for them, we have many senior faculty who um, have been working in, you know, who have developed the courses. So Greg Miller, as I mentioned, he's chair of the accounting department. Um, the associate dean developed the statistics course. Um, many tenured faculty teach in the program. And I should point out that in many programs, that's not always true. So that's another distinctive feature of the Ross <laughs> program. Now, what other learnings uh, have there been uh, in the almost two year period uh, since you launched? I mean, that's, that's a really smart one and a thoughtful one. And I, I get that totally. Yeah, I, I think really, um, again, that idea that um, uh, students, the, the idea of building a community, right? Mm -hmm. So you, again, would think that a student working full time, a, and also they have a family, and they have, um, they have, you know, uh, other obligations, they're trying, they're taking what are very hard courses. Uh, what I think is really, really interesting is that they still want more. So for example, we have had some students who have done the Sanger Leaders Academy, which is not credit bearing. Um, it is just something that they want to do. Uh, we have students who have done the student council. We have students who have joined clubs. In fact, uh, for this year, coming this year, we have students in leadership positions in some of the professional clubs. So I think that has been sort of the, a, a great surprise, right? Um, that they, they really want to be part of Ross. This is not just a tick the box, I'm going to get my MBA. They really want to be part of here. And these are existing clubs with the full-time MBA cohort, right? That is correct. I mean, while I would never ever say that um, COVID has offered us opportunities, one of the things though that it had has done is that it has forced the um, full-time students uh, to really think about how they, um, you know, how they engage remotely. And as a result of engaging remotely, they, the online students have become extremely active in the clubs, which is a really great thing. We hope it continues, even when things get back to what we might call normal. So we spoke earlier about the first cohort that came in uh, two years mm -hmm. ago. I wonder uh, if there's been any major changes in that class profile. I know in the first group, the average work experience is about seven and a half years which is considerably more than in a full-time MBA program and approaching like executive MBA numbers. Uh, any other changes that have occurred since the beginning? Uh, you know, not necessarily. I think the, um, the thing that is interesting is the, is the diversity of the group, you know, I mean, I think you probably know, you know, when it, it, in the past, when it came to part-time MBA programs, it was location, location, location. True. Um, and, and, you know, you had a lot of local people, which is of course is great and is wonderful. And, you know, we're a public university, so that um, makes sense for us. Um, but I think the, the, you know, one of the great things here has been sort of the diversity, as you said, you know, we have a lot of people from California, we have picked up people in Texas and the energy sector. We have people in the financial sector, um, you know, in on, on the East Coast. Um, and it sort of has kind of stayed that way, um, which I think is is really good. Great. I want you to talk a little bit, Patty, about uh, maybe the myths of an online MBA education. I think most people who begin to explore this area uh, and approach of getting an MBA they worry that they won't really get to know their classmates, that they won't really be able to connect with the faculty, uh, and that the network that they acquire once they graduate won't be as valuable as a result. What are you finding? I think that, you know, to be perfectly honest, um, I think that, of course, that is not true, right? Um, these students have built a network. They have built personal relationships with the faculty, but what I always tell applicants is this, is that you will have to be active in if you want to do that. You need to be active. So those chance encounters that you make by 
walking into the Winter Garden here at Ross, for example, you know, walking into the Ross building, those chance encounters are really going to be very low for you, right? They'll be kind of limited to things like residencies. So if you want to build your network, if you want to build relationships with faculty, you need to be active in that, which I think is a good thing, right? Because if you think about your career, I think about my career, I had to be active in my development right, in my professional development. So I think that is one of the things that people need to realize is that, you know, no, it's not impossible. An online degree nowadays is not you sitting at your desk in the dark all by yourself. It is definitely not that. Uh, but you do need to be active in kind of becoming part of the community. It won't be done for you. Now, because this is an online program, I imagine that the disruption caused by the pandemic was nothing like it would be for an on-campus program. But nonetheless, I know that after that first uh, in-residence uh, period that you had, the second one had to bas basically be remote because of the pandemic, right? That's correct. Yes, it was a bit of a misnomer. We had a remote residency, but we had to do that. Um, you know, one of the reasons why was because we knew that we had some students who wanted to graduate. So if we would have put them off for a year, put residencies off until people could come to campus, that wouldn't have been very fair to those students. So we did have remote residencies uh, for, we had two remote residencies this past year. And as you pointed out, you're now back. Uh, so the We are back. You just had the, uh, the, the latest in-person residence on campus, yes. as it should be. And yes, we I'm, did. I'm assuming that the future uh, in-person residencies will be on campus as well, you know, God willing, with <laughs> this pandemic. And yes, I mean, it's uh, just about over, but you never know. Yes, we are uh, looking, as a, you're right, we had a, um, a, our innovation residency, which was just a, about a month ago, and uh, we are looking forward to our fall residency. The students, of course, are looking forward to football, um, so that will be coming in that, in that residency. And also, uh, we're going to have our first international residency, so in May of 2022, uh, Brian Wu, Professor Brian Wu, he will be leading a global strategy residency, which will take place in China. Oh, wow. Uh, will it be Shanghai or Beijing? Yes, he's going to Shanghai and I believe Gangzhou. Ah, that's fantastic. Wow. Yeah, I know. It's very exciting. We just had our first planning meeting a couple of days ago. Wow. So that's something to look forward to in May of next yes. year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So for people enrolling uh, this year, even in the winter uh, intake, you would be able to take advantage of that perhaps, right? Yes, you would. Yes, you would. Now, how, how do you anticipate the program growing even beyond its current size? What, what will be steady state? Yeah. Um, so, you know, we, we aren't looking to admit like thousands of people mm -hmm. um, a year, right? So uh, we want to maintain high admission standards. And if you think about it, you know, if you think about how many people are walking around um, who have sort of that desire, uh, plus, you know, can meet high admission standards, there's, it, it's, it's a smaller number, right? So we are not looking to admit thousands of people. We still want to maintain, just like you talked about, those smaller sections, the smaller residency, that personal touch. Um, I think probably steady state, if we think about, um, you know, a, a, a fall and a winter intake, we're probably in the 120 to 150 range, most likely, I think, steady state. And as you remember, as, as, as we talked about, is that this is a flexible program. So we do think that most students will probably take about three years to finish the program. Um, some students are trying to go much faster. Um, at, at Ross, of course, um, not Ross, but at the University of Michigan, actually you could get, you take, it, you can take 10 years to get your degree, though I certainly would not recommend that, but you can. Um, but I, I think in, yeah, it wouldn't be a good idea. Um, but I do, I think that probably most people will probably take about two and a half to three years. And what well, actually one benefit of that flexibility, which may not be apparent to some people, is you may have an employer that provides an allowance 
uh, yes. for higher education, but there's a limit on it in any given year. And so you might very well be able to get more sponsorship money from your employer if you're able to stretch the program out. And that's, that's often the hidden benefit of the flexibility in terms of length for these programs. Yes, that is an excellent point, is that you can maximize your employer contribution. Let's say your employer gives you, you know, eight to 10,000 a year. You can maximize your employer contribution as well. Um, I've already had, I think it might be three students who've had babies while they've been in the program. So, you know, they've been able to take a little bit of time off so that they can enjoy their baby and then come back. So that's a good thing. There are people who have sort of busy seasons at work. So they can take a half term off for a full term off and then come back. Uh, so yes, flexibility is one of the kind of the biggest things that we were thinking about when we designed this program. Now, one of the other things we haven't yet touched upon, but I think a lot of people are interested in is concentrations or majors or your ability to dip into the portfolio of elective courses. Mm -hmm. What does that look like in the program? Right now, we're thinking through the, uh, the concentration piece. But as far as electives, um, we will have a full slate of electives by the end of next year. We have been developing electives since uh, summer of 2020. I'm, you know, again, John, these years are just like all merging with me. Um, so, uh, but yes, we have a full slate of electives, a variety of things, you know, as you would imagine in the major areas of business. Uh, so, you know, management and organizations and finance and strategy. One of the electives actually that I think we're particularly um, excited about, we have an elective this uh, coming this summer by Professor Lindy Greer, who, which will be on managing diverse teams. Mm -hmm. So, um, a, you know, an elective really based upon diversity and um, and then that elective actually will is going to dovetail with another elective that one of our strategy professors, Chris Ryder, is developing called DEI analytics. So um, to sort of take them both is a really nice compliment. So we're looking forward to that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think if, if you came here, you would be happy with the electives and as well. If it works for you, um, if you are local to Ross, um, you can uh, take uh, electives in person. So you can come and take electives with the full-time full students if you wanted to. Oh, wow, that's a great option. Um, yeah. I know that some of your other programs also uh, allow graduates to take some of the executive education uh, coursework for free. Is that true mm -hmm. with the online MBAs? Yes, that will be true uh, for alumni. They are eligible for alumni advantage as well. Terrific. Okay, so Patty, if you're an applicant out there and you don't know what program is best for you, maybe you're thinking, should I go full-time? Should I go part-time in the evening? Should I do an executive MBA on weekends? Um, or should I do the online MBA? How do, you, how do you help people and guide them through that decision? Because some of these programs are better than others, given what you want out of the MBA and, and where you are in your life. You know, I think I love the way you frame that question, because I often have applicants who say, like in an interview or something, like, sell me on this program. Tell me why I should come to this program. And I always say... I don't know. I, I don't know. I know very little about you. I don't know what your needs are. So I do like the way that you frame that because that is sort of how you should think about it. It's like, what are my needs? And then what, do, how does that fit? And, you know, I always tell people that, you know, decisions require trade-offs. Mm -hmm. So if you're the type of person who, you know, it really is worried about kind of the opportunity costs of taking two years out. Okay, that probably means that a part-time program is probably for you. Um, you might be uh, looking for a specific brand or a, uh, uh, you know, people who, a, a brand that sort of means a specific thing, then I think, again, sort of an online program might be good there because you aren't tied to geography, right? Um, and as well, how many commitments do you have, right? I mean, for some of us, even driving, you know, an hour to a campus could mean a lot for you, right? That, that could be a burden for you. So all of these things require trade-offs. 
Um, I think what I always tell people is this. If you are looking for such a major career change, like let us say you're, a, you're an engineer and you'd like to become an investment banker, I always discourage people from thinking about a part-time program because I, I feel as if if you're making such a major change, you probably need a full-time program because I think you're going to need that internship. You're really going to need that internship. So I think that kind of, to me, is one of the major cruxes about full-time versus part-time. And then part-time in person versus online. Um, I think one of the questions you want to ask yourself is sort of, you know, how much, um, you know, I, I mean, a lot of the online program really is about you motivating yourself to sit down and do work, right? How self-motivated are you? That's one of my interview questions with students, which is um, one of the things I always ask students, uh, one, one of the things I always ask applicants is, tell me about a time when you work towards a goal mm -hmm. where no one was watching but you. Um, and I think that is a big thing for an online program. You have to be motivated. You have to be able to make yourself sit at that desk. Right really all good points and it points to consider if you're thinking about an online MBA program or any MBA program for that matter. Right. Uh, I, I think the other uh, sort of advantage of an online MBA obviously is you don't have to quit your job. Uh, yes. If, if, if you in non-pandemic times have to travel a lot, you can manage an online MBA program where you can't manage these other programs. And yes. uh, they've come along. I mean, you know, this is not the early days of online programming where people were sending VHS tapes out in uh, manila <laughs> envelopes. This is, this is not um, uh, e even the more, you know, more recent times of online M MBA programs where you basically looked at video and had discussions on discussion boards. We're talking right. about programs that are highly interactive, that have the lively interactive sessions with faculty who have office hours, uh, the in-person residencies, including now your upcoming international one in, <laughs> in China. Uh, so they afford you the kinds of things that typically are part of a key full-time MBA experience uh, in a slightly different way, um, but as close to that full-time experience as you can get, you can get now online, which is never true uh, a few years ago. Definitely. I mean, you know, the technology is sort of light years away from um, what it has been. And I agree with you there, you know, you can build relationships this way. Um, and, um, you know, you can have a really fulfilling experience. I mean, that is what students tell me is, you know, wow, what a great class. You know, Catherine Burson teaches a class in advertising management. And, you know, the students tell me that was such a wonderful class. It was all online. There you have it. Well, Patty, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much, John. This has been lots of fun. Great. It's been fun for me and I've learned a lot. And I'm sure everyone who's watched has learned a lot as well. So that's Patty Russo, who is the program director of the online MBA program at Michigan Ross, uh, one of the best programs out there. And like I said before, at the very beginning, uh, the school with the highest ranked full-time MBA program uh, is Michigan Ross that has an online MBA. So that says a lot about the brand value, the quality of the program and all the thinking that has gone into it, along with the quality of the faculty, obviously, uh, which matters a great deal. So this is John Byrne with Poets and Quants. Thanks for watching and thank you, Patty. Thanks, John. Great talking to you. Same here.